Hi, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. In this video, I'm uh, continuing my analysis into an introduction into methods of qualitative research, and we are on section 2.2 of the analysis. We are continuing sort of the, I'm continuing, the analysis into Butler's work and her, her very unique interpretation of the history of feminist theory and her critique of the history of feminist theory. Um, and just to situate the, the discussion so that we are all on the same page, uh, initially Butler is recognizing, she acknowledges the fact that in terms of the structuralist versus post-structuralist approach, the structuralist approach um, is built on and emphasizes the materiality of the subject, the materiality of the body. In terms of that, um, in terms of that emphasis, it's insofar as theorists place that emphasis on sex, on the body, that um, Butler believes binary essentialist notions of, of, of gender and sexual, uh, of gender identification and sex is, is um, rather serves as the basis for this, this tension, right? This tension between men and women, this tension between patriarchy and domination, this tension that results in, for her, the foundation of feminist theory, <clears throat> so that feminist theory is based in this tension. So Eric Gray, via, via Butler's articulation of Eric Gray's position, um, Butler says Eric Gray posits feminine identity, the identity of the woman as a consequence of exclusion. Right? The identity of the man is sort of an isolated existence, it exists independent to anything itself. I'm going to talk about applications in terms of genetic applications in the 21st century, sort of reinforcing that point in either this section or the last section of the, the lecture series. And, and the woman, however, the, the woman's different because the woman exists exclusively within this dichotomous binary relationship wherein she is excluded from, she is excluded. Her, her, this is Butler's articulation of Aragorae, and I discussed this, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Um, and her identity is one of exclusion, and as such, it's through this process of exclusion, through the phylogocentric economy, that the woman's identity is um, affirmed. It comes into <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the fort. I should have brought a water, bottle of water here. But the idea is um, Butler does not accept the position and refuses to acknowledge the theoretical um, force of an attempted subjective identification which is itself contingent on exclusion. So now in the last section I talked about why this is problematic, sort of why it is problematic to confer subjective identification for the woman as a consequence of the process of exclusion through the system of phylogocentric economy. It's which is a mouthful, but hopefully that makes sense. Um, it's it's important to recognize that we are now uh, we are now at the point where we can understand exactly how she pulls this off and what she leaves us with. Okay, so this is intro to methods of qualitative and this is uh, section two point two. <coughs> Okay. Section 2.2, and this is the fourth part of Butler. I spent quite a bit of time on Butler, and now we get to see sort of the crux of the um, historical critique um, on the traditional conception, the, cr the traditional structuralist basis for feminist theory. So the core is Plato's, in Plato's Timaeus, and this is Butler versus Plato. So this is a quote from Plato, I've given the citation. The core is, this is Plato now, the universal nature which receives all bodies. All right, so for Plato, the core, okay, so the core is the universal nature which receives all bodies, right? So you can think of it as almost infinite and it receives all bodies. So the core for Plato is the universal nature which receives all bodies that must be always called the same, right? It must be always called the same. For inasmuch as she, Butler identifies this contradiction, I'll explain this in a second, um, 
Inasmuch as she, Plato, when he talks about the Quora, he identifies the he he engenders the Quora. Right? So for Plato, this Quora for Plato is gendered. This is gendered. So he identifies, he says in the text, you can read the text yourself, Plato, Plato says, the universal nature which receives all bodies that must always be called the same, it doesn't change, it's fixed, right? So for Plato, the Quora is gendered. For Plato, the Quora is fixed, infinitely fixed. Okay. The Quora is the universal nature which receives all bodies that must always be called the same for inasmuch as she with reference to the Quora, always, top of page 31, always receives all things, she never departs at all from her own nature, and never, in any way, or at any time, assumes a form. There is no form for the Plato, for, the, for the Plato. There is no form um, for Plato of the Quora. Right? So we might talk about the form of beauty, or the form of justice, or the form of, the form of temperance. There is no form for the Quora, Yet, the core is infinite. It exists as the infinite receptacle of all things, of all bodies. And I know this seems sort of spooky, like, what in the world does this have to do with anything? Just sort of conceptually, you know, put your, put your, uh, put your doubt or uncertainty aside and just ride the Plato wave, if you will. <laughs> she never departs at all from her own nature, and never in any way or at any time assumes a form. Now, this is Butler's critique, so that citation was directly from Plato, this is what Butler has to say in response to what I just read from Plato. So from Plato, we get a gendered Quora. We recognize that this gendered Quora exists for all time infinitely, and it facilitates um, all infinite bodies. It accommodates, sort of, and we'll see what this accommodation does in a second. So this is Butler's response to this. Plato clearly wants to disallow the possibility of a resemblance between masculinity and femininity, and he does this through introducing a feminized receptacle. It's feminized because he uses the word she. The receptacle is the Quora that receives all bodies that is prohibited from resembling any form. Right? The Quora is itself prohibited from resembling any form. So what I'm going to do throughout the rest of this um, section is I'm going to give you a piece from Plato because I've read it and I have uh, the, the text. So I, via Butler, found the citation, the reference, in the Timaeus to the Quora. I extract and directly cite that section in Plato with his reference to the Quora. Then we go to Butler's um, Bodies That Matter and her direct response to those sections in the Quora. So you have Plato direct, then you'll have um, Butler's critique of what Plato said, and this is going to be the pattern with which we'll understand how she destabilizes Plato's um, assumptions, right? So that should be clear. So the problem that Butler has, so this is this is Plato. Butler's problem Oops. Butler's problem Butler's problem with this is is the following, right? Plato clearly wants to disallow the possibility of a resemblance between masculinity and femininity. And he does this through introducing a feminized receptacle, right? So we know the receptacle is feminized. That's obvious. I don't need to write that down. That is prohibited from resembling any form, right? So it exists without form. So one of the first problems that Butler has is the existence of the Quora without form. I'll explain why this is important, right? And so I'm going to create a list of all of Butler's problems because it's very hard to track. And then we will see why these conceptual, rather abstracted, ideological... Well, then, I, mean, I guess they could be ideological, but I'm going to approach it from a theoretical standpoint. Um, why these um, theoretical presuppositions about feminine identity um, inform existing patriarchal norms, right? And I guess it is ideological because patriarchy, patriarchy is ideological, but I'm not going to take it to that level. Um, so this is A at the top of page 31. Plato again. So what does Plato say? Plato, and never assumes a form, right? The Quora never assumes a form. Now this is me. 
The use of the term form here has a necessary epistemic relation to matter. You can watch this for more insight. I have no idea what that link is. I mean, that would help, Jason. Um, I probably should have put, in, put brackets. Um, hold on. Uh, how, why would I do that? I have no idea what that's referenced uh, to. Um, and I, but I, I mean, I can still continue with the lecture. I just, next time for my own mental note, I'll have to make sure that I know what the hyperlink links to. Um, it probably, it probably links to form matter dis distinction, probably in Aristotle. I'm not positive, but I would assume that that's what I linked it to. But irrespective of the case, I'll pick up with this discussion on forms. So, B, one, I deny that Plato had a theory, a proper, quote-unquote, theory of the forms, and interpret that his use of the forms here is a precondition, or actually it might be the hierarchy. It's probably a link to um, Plato's hierarchical discussion is probably what it is, right? So we have mimesis and conjecture at the bottom, we have the form at the top, we have everything in the middle, it's probably a link to that, so I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. So I deny that Plato had a, um, a theory of the forms and interpret that his use of the forms here is a precondition for the universal quantifier. Okay, what in the world are we talking about? You have to remember that logic was a discovery um, that is historically situated within the evolution or, you know, progression, you know, you know, evolution would be the wrong word, but the progression of human history, right? So there was a time at which we discovered what logic is and what logic does. Plato exists for all practical purposes prior to that time because it was a student, Aristotle, that really sort of spearheaded logic. So you have to imagine that there's a sense in which Plato recognizes the, the use of logic. He recognizes the distinction between anybody who's taken the basic LSAT you know the all sum distinction, right? All cl all cl claims that talk about all or universal sets, um, as opposed to the claims that talk about some or few sets, two distinctions, two levels. So that when we talk about the Quora, what Plato is attempting to do is articulate in the Quora, right? In his discussion of the Quora. Now this is uniquely my analysis, right? This is uniquely my analysis. However, I think. Butler is suggesting this. She's not explicit in this. Um, she does, once we arrive at the final contradiction with which she collapses Plato's dichotomy, um, um, I think this. I think Butler would say, yes, that is that is an application of what I'm attempting to say, but to be able to understand what will become an enormous, blaring contradiction in Plato's theory, um, the only way that I can articulate this is by reference to logic, right? So, the Korra is sort of infinite, and thus it's supposed to be, it, it's conceptualized, obviously this happened, this predates, so it's a bit anachronistic here, but you have to be able to use this idea um, to make sense of what Plato's doing. The Korra is a universal set, right? It exists as such. In its existence, it helps in shaping all, and we'll see this, I'm sort of jumping ahead there, because I don't think I've actually said this, but I'll say it now since I have to say it. Um, it aids in shaping all form, all matter. It is a condition in which it is, it, it manipulates and it makes malleable and transforms all matter, if you will, but is itself disaffected to change. It's fixed forever, right? So this, this ability, if you will, theoretically speaking, um, requires that it, it is a member, it is the universal set, right? Everything exists within it, right? It is an aspect, an element of it, but it transcends any individual existence. Okay, very, very, we're like super abstract theory now, so there is no good of philosophy today. I apologize, so uh, I, that should make sense, right? That should make sense. So, I deny that Plato has a theory of the forms and interpret that his use of the forms here is a precondition for the universal quantifier, which necessitates matter as the existential instantiation of that universal form, meaning any individual body, right, that enters the Quora, if you will. You can imagine just visually, we have bodies coming into this universally large sort of processing thing. It gets into the Quora, the Quora shapes it and spits it back out. Just, I mean, this is neither Plato nor Butler, this is me trying to, now we're doing ghetto so that you can understand. You can imagine like the body comes in, it takes a shape as conferred by the Korah, and when it comes out, it's slightly different, right? 
it's different than it was when it went in. But its transformation as a consequence of its interaction with the Korah does not affect the Korah. The Korah remains fixed. Right? Thus, the Korah is an aspect of the universal set. Any individual um, body that we're looking at is, is an instantiation of it. Right? It becomes what it is as a consequence of the Korah's impression, if you will. Right? Um, that is, as, um, as an instantiation of being. So I'll explain this in a little bit. So before I go on to the implications, what we need to recognize, so click the link, I'm almost positive it goes to Plato's, Plato's um, hierarchy of the forms. I'm not going to do the full hierarchy, I'm just going to begin with the highest form and the lowest form, M-E-M-I-M-E-S-I-S, uh, -E -S -S, yeah, E-S-I-S. -S. This is an epistemological, E-P-I-S-T. Uh, hierarchy, if you will. It's an epistemological hierarchy where we're talking about mimicking as the lowest level, right? The ability to mime or mimic is the lowest level of knowledge because you can communicate, obviously, mimes do communicate things, but so much of what's being communicated is interpretational. Right? It's clear that the, 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 the mime is in a box, if you will, but we can't tell you any characteristics or qualities, no empirically verifiable, no observable, no, um, no aspect of mimesis, to be technical, no aspect of mimesis leads to, in and of itself, anything other than conjecture, like as its greatest manifestation. There's, no, there's nothing to be had. So, uh, on a side note, Plato talks about this specifically in, in discussion with um, a community of artisans in the Republic, you know, the, the, the poets and such, and believe that those within the Republic, the philosopher kings and such, need to have regulation and control over the poets because you can imagine if it doesn't take much wit, much brain, much intellectual power to consume and to understand the information, then those who speak at that base level have the most pervasive audience, right? If, if, assuming a sort of stereotypical conceptualization of the mass and mass culture and blah, blah, blah. Thus, it's, in the, it's the responsibility of the philosopher king, the rulers and such, to make sure that the poets, the artists and such are controlled, right? Why? Because the mimetic way isn't a way that reflects real reality. It's not a physics, right? It's not a real articulation of the real. It's an imitation. It's mystical. It's fanciful. It's allegorical. It's metaphorical. It intimates, at best, reality. And even that is a bit of, you know, that's too much credit. It really intimates nothing other than, you know, perversions of reality. But it's readily consumable. It, people love that, right? The masses love sort of this, this poetic, mimetic um, mode of understanding. It is the farthest thing from what really is, and thus those who are in control, those in the intelligentsia and otherwise, and this isn't to say that everybody, but this is Plato. Um, the philosopher kings and definitely sort of the ruling uh, intellects, Plato included, are responsible for the control of, and the oversight of that group of the population because they sway lots of power over the mass, right? They sway lots of power over the mass. And the idea is those who really know deal with forms, those who don't really know, those who sort of you know, just exist, if you will, it's vulgar to say it that the mass exists mimetically. Mimetic existence is an existence of the, the mirage, if you will. It's not the real at all. It's the symbolic, if you will, to, to, to put it in um, sort of psychoanalytic terms, right? It doesn't have to be Lacanian, but you would imagine that the real existence, the formal existence, is real. Right? The formal existence is a real existence. In the contemporary discourse, we would say this is sort of the truth of physics and such, right? Or, I mean, I know this is obviously assuming a, a secular standpoint, but the, dot, but the truth of physics as real. As opposed to any number of narratives that intimate the truths of physics by creating an allegorical story for either some cosmology or cosmogony, right? So that's, that's the distinction. Don't want to spend too much time on there. But, but what, we, 
realize is what we realize in, in Butler's analysis, and I, I think this is going to end up being genius, is there's already some there's already some tension here. There's already some difficulty in Plato's narrative because the idea of the Kora is presented as real, but not only is it presented as real, he he feminizes this eternal existence, and we'll see why this becomes problematic later. Right? He feminizes by using she. Right? He feminizes this eternal existence, and thus you can imagine the sort of at least initially the hypocrisy of attempting to articulate as per the philosopher kings, as per the theory of forms, um, this eternal existence that has been feminized. This is going to be problematic, and we'll see why in a bit. The, 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 the sort of foreshadowing is that really what Plato has done here is mimetic. He hasn't really given us any, he hasn't really given us any real demarcation. What he's given us is the greatest lie ever told. He's taught us about mimesis by, by lying about the fact that he was practicing mimetic um, narrative. And, and essentially is what he's doing. This, uh, Nietzsche, Nietzsche loathes <laughs> you know, Plato for precisely this sort of this, this falsity, this inauthenticity, if you will. So I'll get to all of that and make sense of it in a bit. It's a bit sort of um, abstract. It's extremely abstract, but I'll just stick around. So, implication on uh, page 31. So, the first implication on uh, both my account and Butler's account, the feminine is neither the condition for the existence, for existence, the feminine is neither the condition for existence, that is, the feminine is posited as this universal set with which all elements, the elements being existence itself, individual aspects and components of existence, exist. Being, this is Heideggerian, if you will, being, right? Their being, Dasein. The feminine isn't the condition with which all transformation is facilitated and is itself, in uh, um, a Heraclitean sense, always perpetually in a state of transformation. No. For Plato, the feminine is fixed, everything comes in, and everything that comes out is new. So you can see the passivity of this universal set. This universal set does nothing for all practical purposes. It has one role and one role only. Create, create transformation. Right? It's the source for creative transformation, but it is itself fixed. And anybody who's read Plato, anybody who knows anything about sort of his conceptualization of midwifery and such, this is a good account. I understand what was Plato was trying to do, but with respect to a feminist interpretation of this, you can see why that... that um, universally, infinitely passive set becomes problematic. I mean, this is clear now, right? Universally passive um, is something that you should be thinking about sort of in the back of your mind at this point, right? So, um, and I'll take this much deeper, but on both my account and Butler's account, the feminine is neither the condition for existence, right? It didn't create the, the individual bodies. It, it isn't the source for creation. It transforms creation. Right? So it's not, in an Aristotelian sense, the uncaused cause of, right? It isn't the, the condition with which all creation is, in fact, manifest. It's not. What it is, it's a, it's a mode of passive, receptive, infinitely passive, infinitely receptive transformation. Okay? So both my account and Butler's account, the feminine is neither the condition for existence, it doesn't create existence, nor is the feminine materialized as a specific existence. It's not existential, it's, it's general. That is, this and only this existence. Butler's essential insight is that the feminine is, and this is key, through but not of. The feminine is through but not of, right? The feminine is that through which bodies manifest their materiality, right? And we understand what this means in a very vulgar way banal sense. The man ejaculates into the woman's vagina via her vagina. She creates life. The creation of life internal to the woman is then expelled from the woman and given back to materiality. Her body becomes the means with which materiality is 
fashioned so that her body is a vehicle for fashioning materiality and it is infinitely in place for it is infinitely in place and it is constructed for the purpose of fashioning the materiality of existence it does not produce existence because we know where that seminal act comes from definitely I tended to make a pun with that the semen comes from the man so that existence comes from the man and we'll see how this applies in a bit so existence and materiality is itself derived from the man in terms of the ejaculate that enters this infinite receptacle I'm making this very sort of base by sort of taking it to copulation but you have to obviously because that's what's that's what we're talking about obviously as a theoretical framework with which all of this is constructed it would be it would be um, irresponsible not to address the obvious now what ends up happening is the woman becomes the mode for which we identify through but not of it's through her that we identify what's real but she herself is neither an infinitely transforming creative force for existence she doesn't create the conditions with which materiality comes about what she creates is this transformation of existing bodies so she fashions you can imagine her as being a mode of fashioning and that's it infinitely fashioning material existence so that should be clear now it's clear what it's key what um, Butler says through but not of I'll return to that because that's very important right so the second problem that Butler has is that problem of and that's the end of that marker second problem that Butler has is through but not of. I'll tie all of these in um, later. The second implication, man is the condition for existence. As generalized, and this and only this existence is either man or it is not man. Man becomes the condition for existence. Why? Because just like we do with the Big Bang Theory, or just like we do with any cosmogonical theory, the question is, well, if there was a Big Bang, what came before the Big Bang? And blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to go into the physics of this all. It's an elementary question, which actually has to be answered. But in order to avoid any infinite regress, the source of all, the source of all cosmogony, at least in contemporary understanding, who knows what physicists might dis discover, right? They might transform this and recognize that, no, we were thinking linearly, and it's more cyclically. So, you know, here's some new physical, you know, interpretation of reality. I think would be sort of more, it would have more um, appeal for me intellectually. I think the fundamental, the fundamental confusion is one of linearity. I don't believe that, me personally. I don't have the physical physicist training to prove this, but I, intuitively I just don't believe in a linear sort of conception of time, right? But if you are articulating, so one of the presuppositions of all of this is a linear conception of time, where it progresses sort of like this and not like this in a hermeneutic, if you have a linear conception of time, then the ultimate problem is one of infinite regress. Because if we say that this is the beginning, then we recognize that that beginning is the condition for the, for the existence of everything. But is itself uncreated? But then the question, obviously, that, that the two-year-old asks is, well, where did that come from? In, in this sense, that question can't be valid. Why? Because the very evocation of that question undermines the linearity of time. Um, but that aside, that aside... What we recognize is the existence of bodies exist independent to the existence of the Korah. The Korah only fashions the body. The body was already there. Semen was already... And obviously, you know, we have to think about... Um, so as we are not anachronistic with respect to Plato's situatedness in time, the ejaculate is obvious. The egg and all the enzymes and hormones that bring about the fashioning of a human body that, was, that transcended any sort of ancient belief. No, they could, there's no way they could have approximated the, the truth of, you know, human biology and physiology and um, the, enormous, the enormous role of hormones and enzymes in the fashioning of a human being. A substantial amount of the work of fashioning comes from the woman. All a man has to do is ejaculate. But what do we see in the world in that time? Put yourself back then. What do we see as the only thing? The only thing that we see as a thing is the semen, the cum, the ejaculate, right? So, man's existence is readily identifiable. Man's existence is external, not internal. Man's existence is in the world. 
not of the world. The man creates and fa well, man creates and women fashions all of this existence. But what woman does is internalized. It's hidden. It's mystical. It's beyond. It's beyond any sort of comprehension at that time, at that era. We're going to take this and we're going to see how this obviously antiquated idea <laughs> still reigns supreme in 2013. 13. You should be thinking, this is the most cliched, outdated, old school, ridiculous, super generalization. And uh, if you feel that, then you're right, it is. And then the question is, well, why are we still making appeals to this in 2013, given all the advances in science? We know that this is ridiculous. Um, but I still have more to flush out, so I'll explain, I'll explain a little bit in a second. So, man is, <coughs> man is a condition, condition for existence. As generalized, and this and only this existence is either man or it is not man, which is then identified as woman. As per Butler's articulation of Eric Gray's position, woman is being um, constituted as having her subjective identity conferred as a consequence of this rejection, as a consequence of this exclusion from male identity. That is, by the erasure absence of men and the elusive and universal referent. Right? Um, so here's, here's, here's uh, a rather substantial quote, substantially thick quote in Plato. I'll take time to make sure that I flesh out the significance of the quote uh, in detail. So Plato says, this is a direct quote, quote, Like that of any of the things which enter into her, this is a direct quote, any of the things that enter into her, now that I framed it in terms of copulation, this is obvious, right? Even if I didn't, I guess this would have been obvious, right? Like that of any of the things that enter into her, emphasis on her, presupposes that the Korah is not a thing, right? This presupposes that the Korah is not a thing because we're talking about sort of this, this absence. Entering into her, he's not referencing the receptacle itself. He's not talking about, you can imagine that we have a barrel, right? And contents are poured into the barrel. Plato is not talking about the structure of the barrel itself. He's talking about that vacuum inside as the creative force, right? So it's not the barrel. It's not the physical externality, if you will. Because remember, he talks about this universally. So there really is no. I have to draw this because otherwise it's, 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 um, it's impossible to represent this without just appealing to like logic or maybe math. math mathematics could sort of could um, represent this, but I have to represent this visually. So we're talking about that which is infinite, um, but it is itself not emphasized by what it is as much as the emphasis is on this, this is being emphasized, sort of the space, right? the condition of this interiority is being, um, being highlighted by Plato. So we're not talking about a thing. We're not talking about stuff. We're not talking about, we're definitely not talking about materiality. But what we're talking about with respect to the Korah is this creative, transformative um, force, right? You can think of the Korah as, and this is giving Plato way too much credit, but in credit to Plato, I guess the best way you could conceptualize contemporarily what the Korah is, because it's a very difficult thing to understand what it even means, and a lot of feminist authors pick up on it, so I encourage feminists, both male and female feminists, um, to reinvestigate the sort of the conception of the core given contemporary 21st century advances in math and physics and such. But I would, I would argue in defense of Plato, just for a moment, that the core is more of a force relationship, right? It's not something that you can see in the world per se. It's not something that you can touch per se. It's not something that's readily, readily tangible, but it is the condition for all, if you will, tangibility. And right? it is sort of this operative, invisible force, so that the force the force, the Korah is a force relation, right? To be charitable. I would say to Plato, it's something like that, right? It, it, a force relation would make sense. You, like gravitational force, you can, you can have an understanding, a contemporary understanding of what he might have meant then. Because he's not talking about something that's physical, that's empirical, that's tangible, that's destructible, that's divisible. But it is that which all matter, all stuff sort of coheres, right? It is the, the invisible nexus, if you will, that allows for the coherence of all stuff. And I mean coherence in terms of cohesion, but also coherence in terms of comprehension, epistemologically. So, 
Plato, like that of any of the things which enter into her, right? This presupposes we're not talking about a thing into this force. You can think of gravitational attraction almost, right? Enters into her. She is the natural recipient of all impressions, right? She is the natural recipient of all impressions. So everything impresses itself on her, right? This is universal passivity, right? And I talked about that earlier. So it's universally passive set. It's actually really interesting that Plato was able to conceive this independent to physics, right? Independent to an understanding of, um, you know, anatomical biology. It's very abstract, very ethereal, but it's actually, it's scary how much this really does apply to many, many things. Now, granted, you are exposing a lot of, because, the, 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 and this is a genius too, because his discourse is so sim, symbolical, 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 right? It's filled with symbology. It also reflects a lot of, so I guess I'm reflecting a lot of myself by how I interpret this, because my appeals to physics and such, um, it, it reflects a lot of my interpretive mode, but I think the truth of the matter is this is clearly what Plato's talking about. I think at a um, mimetic level, we're talking about copulation. I think at a formal level, we're talking about cosmo cosmogony. We're talking about the cosmogony of everything. So I, I, I don't believe that the two are inseparable uh, in a very interesting way, right? I think the two are are very much related. And I mean that in a contemporary sense, too, that physics at the macro level or uber, you know, um, quantum level, um, as well as our biology, uh, there's, there's, uh, there's, there has to be some sort of interplay between the two. So she is the natural recipient of all impressions, again, with emphasis on the gendered term she, and is stirred and informed by them, right? She is herself not the source for information, but she is the receptacle for all externalities. She is the receptacle for the impression she is the infinitely passive means with which all impression makes itself known. It impresses upon her. And we'll see, you should be thinking now, well, there might be a contradiction in this, right? But um, I don't want to get there too quick. This is universal epistemic passivity, right? Which means there is no foundation for the creation of information here. All information is reposited, if you will, here. It is itself not a source for information. You can see, you can see how this very sort of suggestive language, and the fact that he's already gendered the Quora, Why wouldn't you apply this in uh, socio-political or even familial relations? Why wouldn't you say that? Listen, women are—they're there, they are identifiable, um, but they don't really have much to say. They don't really have any depth. They receive all information, and the reception of all of this information, for all practical purposes, isn't going to create um, new information. All it does is the transformation of things that are already known. You can see how these biases inform very, very subtly, right? It's not explicit here. It's very, very suggestive, very, very symbolic language. But the idea is, insofar as we've already gendered the Korah, and insofar as we talked about this infinite passivity of the Korah, and the fact that it is infinitely receiving endless impressions, obviously this is sort of palpitation in sex, right? This is the actual undulation of sexual intercourse, right? The man is impressing himself on the woman. He is forming and fashioning, you know, the womb, if you will. And she is there just receiving these impressions. Obviously it's copulation and it's in its sort of banal vulgarity. But I think on an epistemological level, we recognize that man is the source for the creation. Man is the source for the, the contribution of intellect, and intellect becomes phylogocentric. To be smart is to be masculine, right? We are, and I, this is obviously ridiculous, right? But, so I'm, you know, sometimes I really get into the role and people confuse it and think I believe this. I don't believe this, obviously, I'm just getting into the role. But we are, man is, the source for the creative force in the universe. We are the source for knowledge. Women exist with us, but women aren't part of this intellectual contribution. And you have centuries and centuries and centuries and centuries of disbelief. Why? Because there's a failure to recognize, and this is going to be key later, there's a failure to recognize that it's not just of, it's not just through, but of. It's not, it's not, there's a failure in Western tradition, categoric, huge failure in Western 
tradition to identify, and I don't, I, you know, there are historical, socio-historical reasons for this, and acknowledge the ability for intellect and insight and information to have its root, to have its basis in a woman, literally in a specific individual woman, her, right? So, you know, if you ask, um, high school students should know this, but if you ask high school students, like, you know, who is responsible, high school students should know this, so maybe middle school. I, I'm going to ask my kids, as a matter of fact, when I go home, do you know anybody, who's, who started science fiction? Right, who's, oh, it's probably Tolkien started, or C.S. Lewis started science fiction, or I don't know, some other person started science fiction. It was actually um, Shelley, right, a woman started science fiction in the publication of um, the narrative on Frankenstein, right? But it's just the, just the acknowledgement of, right, that of, and I'm, I'm jumping ahead here, but that of is very, very important, right? Not through, but of. And in a bit, I'll, I'll flush that out. I still have quite a bit more to go through. But that, that, that acknowledgement of is huge. The act of acknowledging is huge. Why? Because the act of acknowledgement in and of itself legitimizes existence. Right? So in my race theory, um, prior to the discovery of Victoria Falls and on the continent of Africa, um, white man came and believed that, well, we discovered this, right? We discovered Victoria Falls, and thus we name it Victoria Falls. Right? So you look at it, you're just like, oh, it's Victoria Falls now. It has existence. Its existence as a thing is legitimized in the naming of. We've named it. Obviously, for millennia prior to the discovery of Victoria Falls, and you know, I had a student once, and I gave this lecture, and she actually knew the real name of Victoria Falls. Unfortunately, I apologize. This is like off the top of my head. I didn't prepare this. Um, so if I did, I would have put it in my notes. But there's a real name to Victoria Falls, and it's not Victoria Falls. So that the conferral of subjective identity is housed in the ability to name, and men do the naming, right? The, the scientists go out, they discover the planet, they name the planets. The biologists go out, they discover the new life forms, they name it. So the ability to put a name to something is hugely powerful, right? It's, it's a mode of power. Why? Because the name has a reference, and that ability to refer... Um, at this very sort of basic level, can be individuated, named by the father or named by the mother. The truth of the matter is, and I have to be careful because I don't want to piss people off in terms of religion, but I've already published this, so it's been out for years now. It's almost a decade that it's been out, which is crazy to think that, it's, that in 2015 will be a decade since I published my transgender piece. Um, that's insane. With one of my best friends, you know, if, I, if you can use that term loosely, um, Chioki Ayansen, and it is in the name of the Father, I baptize you, sort of the non-existent thing yet, this, this, this materiality without a soul, you, you get the conferral of absolute divine subjective identity and salvation in the name of the Father. And that's key, that really is key, and I, if you want to see more about how I flushed that out, read my my bit on um, transsexuality and transgenderism, um, and I, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to be mean, I'm not trying to be critical, but the idea is we have to call it what it is. There are existence independent to the naming, but once the man arrives, he then embodies the ability, the power to name, and the conferral of the name, you will be known as X, is, my gosh, it's huge, it's huge, right, it's huge. I could take that deeper, but um, now's not the time or the place to sort of do this. But I think it's clear now what's going on, right? And is stirred and informed by them, and appears different from time to time, by reason of them. Now here's Butler's, uh, Butler's account, and, and I forgot the open quotes, but it is a direct quote. Plato's phantas, um, phantasmatic, phantasmatic, like a phantasm, phantasmatic, Plato's phantasmatic economy virtually deprives the feminine of a morph, of a shape. This is why I told you this isn't accurate, right? You can't, conceptually speaking, I have to draw something on the board so you can see it, but it really is more of a force relation, right? It's, it's, it's something that exists and keeps things sort of in tow. It is receiving impressions continually, but is itself shapeless, the best way to talk about it is in terms of force relations, which is why I brought it up, but, but I need to draw something. Um, so Butler says, Plato's phantas 
matic economy virtually deprives the feminine of a morph. We recognize this as the feminine because Plato calls the Korah she and her. A shape. For as a receptacle, the feminine is a permanent and hence non-living, shapeless, non-thing, which cannot be named. The feminine is this. Right? The feminine isn't the feminine isn't the barrel. Right? The feminine isn't the barrel. The feminine is the is the invisible space occupying the barrel. It's it's that nothing. It's that invisibility. Right? It's that absence of things. Now, you know, you might be able to do a bizarre 21st century uh, re-articulation of Plato in a neo-neo-platonic slash cyborg physics physicist articulation of emptiness and absence of sort of at the atomic level. I mean, that's a huge creative element, right? It really does. But that's that's not doing justice to what Butler's doing. That's taking it on a whole nother level. But I like the sort of oscillation in, in philosophy. Philosophers debate forever. You know, we're professional argue, uh, uh, debaters. We get paid to argue. We get paid to debate. We get paid to be in sort of intellectually discomforting situations. So it's not a bad thing to have everything that you believed in collapse. Because then it allows you to rebuild everything from scratch. <laughs> if you're a philosopher, right? Um, the idea is, in terms of, in terms of the, in terms of the, um, the ability for the woman to be identified, she can't, she can't be identified, given the science at the time, given the theoretical conceptualizations that's derived from the knowledge at the time. It's just void. It's absence. There's nothing there. We know now that void is profoundly more meaningful. That emptiness is profoundly more influential in the creative process, but that's because of technology and advances in Western, and I mean not just Western, global sort of um, science. The idea at the time is there's there's this absence here, and she is the condition for all of the transformative elements in creation. She doesn't create herself. Creation goes through her, and through her it gains its. Um, its identity, but it already existed. The thing that I'm trying to articulate is feminine, but it doesn't have any shape. It doesn't have any form. It doesn't have any const um, it doesn't have any um, constituent elements to it. You can think of sort of an old cliched, um, rather egregious generalization of the vagina as just being a it's so vulgar uh, of a hole. I, I, I forgive me infinitely. You know, but this is sort of the level that we're at, right? It's, it's a hole. There's nothing there. Um, in terms of in terms of that absence, it's this. It's this absence that Butler. Now, to be specific, it's this absence that Butler has a problem with, a huge problem, because it's in this absence that the structuralist um, conceptualization of feminism and her, her, her. Uh, her opponent in Irigaray is situated, right? So it's in absence that feminine identity is rooted, right? She has a huge problem with that, right? She has a huge problem with the fact that it is in this absence that feminine identity is rooted, that feminine identity isn't constituted in manifest sort of reality, that it is a consequence of this absence, and obviously, in her articulation of Irigaray's point, it is the exclusion of the feminine that her identity is conferred through this process of exclusion. She wants to deny this, right? She wants to deny this. We can see now how that, how that was informed. It was informed by Plato's conception of the Korah. The Korah is itself really, I, I should erase the boundary, is itself informed by an infinite receptacle. The infinite receptacle is sort of um, anachronistically speaking absent, empty, nothing. We know now it's to sort of re-articulate it in a contemporary sense. You might call it a force relation, but back then in, in Plato's era it was nothing, it was absence, it was devoid of anything. Yet that absence, that, that inability to identify any materiality was part, a constituent part of what we see in the world, and you can see it's not far of a stretch. It really isn't that far of a stretch to then take Plato's articulation in the Timaeus 
and tie it to um, the overwhelming belief in spontaneous generation, uh, yeah, spontaneous generation up until uh, the scientific enlightenment, right? There was a belief that if you leave dirty socks out, inanimate objects could create organic objects. Dirty socks and garbage creates, creates life. What in fact, now we know obviously it's the flies and blah, blah, blah. And the cheesecloth, sort of the famous cheesecloth example demonstrated and proved this, right? And pasteurization and all that other crap. But the idea is you can see how you can then tie this belief in Plato directly to assumptions informing all of our dark age mystical beliefs, which was, you know, life is created from inorganic stuff. Um, now, granted, this might be able to happen in a lab with some serious high-tech physics, sure. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about this on an ontological level. We're not talking about the possibility of ex nihilo ontologically. Who knows what scientists will be able to do in the future? I always leave a little room open for, you know, the conceivably impossible. We're talking about just regular, mundane, basic, day-to-day -day life. Obviously, that's false, right? No, there is a source for creation. It's just that that source is invisible to the naked eye. It's, it's micro. Plato had no ability to articulate that in all of... Uh, Western civilization is based in that scientific sort of blackness, that void in science at the time. But like I've been saying nonstop through this lecture series, that absence of information, of real, formal knowledge, the real stuff of the world, um, informed a society that mimicked that absence in science. And what do we have? This, uh, this trickles down from the absence in science to our social practices, and thus, rather than talking about women or her in some abstraction, in terms of some uh, astronomy or astrology at the time, in terms of talking about it in terms of some uh, mathematical relationship, we don't do that. We talk about it in terms of the embodiment of her, the woman. Obviously, Plato wrote it as gendered. The guy, the gal on the street reading this, probably the guy reading this, I, reads her. He's not thinking abstractly. He's thinking about his wife. He's thinking about his daughter. He's thinking about his mom. He's thinking about the women around him. And, oh, of course, yeah, I mean, obviously, obviously, yeah, they, they, the women, are impressionable. What does impressionable evolve into? Emotional, obviously. If you're impressionable, you're emotional, right? Oh, you impress upon them, you impress upon them, you impress upon them, and, uh, you know, they break and they, sh they cower and they're fearful and they're excitable and they're hysterical and, you know, the, all of that then unfolds. Why? Because we have not articulated what the woman is, what it means to be a woman other than... The existence of um, subjective identity of the woman is that which is excluded. It's not material. It's not physical. It's an absence. It's not pregnant with epistemological findings and abilities. It is passively, infinitely receiving the knowledge. Um, obviously, the knowledge being semen. It's passively, infinitely waiting, right? Um, and the, the idea, a quick side note, uh, the idea of waiting would be awesome. Um, to wait is, believe it or not, uh, already a feminized concept in the West, right? To use the word wait in the United States sort of English, not, uh, and probably British English as well, right? To use the word wait, it, it has a real feminist... I would, I would love to read a feminist critique on the concept of waiting. That would be... So it wouldn't be a phenomenology, but, like, feminist critique on the concept of waiting would be the most gangsterous ever publication. Like, a small little journal article just on waiting. Right? Women are supposed to wait. Sit patiently, Mary, and wait your turn. You know, Bob, you go out there and take it. You go out there and get it. You go out there and grab it. Strong arm it. You know, that's masculine. But to wait? Oh, God, no. Waiting is for women. Women wait. Men take. <laughs> it would be awesome. I mean, it's amazing how much you... This is pregnant with social science research implications, right? Um, but I want to stay on track because otherwise I'll be here all day. Um, you, you recognize that this... This is very, very, very powerful, this concept of the Korah in Plato's Timaeus. is very, very um, impactful in shaping the way in which the West conceptualizes a woman, and women in general. And in terms of uh, Butler's assessment, what's happening here isn't looking really good. It's not looking good at all. Um, so, top of page 32, this is A. Plato, quote, this is Plato now, enter into her that his bodies enter into her, natural recipient, informed by reason of them. So she is informed by them, they enter into her, and it sort of... 
<coughs> excuse me. They, externality, enters into her. It, externality, informs her. She is informed by them. Passive, universally, waiting, infinitely for knowledge. Never a source of creation, only a source of transformation. The source of transformation is the transformation of that which had already existed. So she facilitates really only one function, and it is this transformative phenomena, and, uh, and that's problematic, right? That's hugely problematic for Butler. So I, the implication, they have reason, they impress their reason by entering into her. They, men, have reason. They, men, impresses man's reason into her, and she is just there sort of receiving. Number two, their participation in her, their participation in her, molds her, but she refuses form, cannot attain form. Remember, and this is a direct quote, she never assumes a form. So what ends up happening? You can imagine, I mean, this might be taking it far, but there is a sense in which, I mean, it seems, it seems harsh to take it to rape. Uh, it's quite a, a theoretical jump. But if you are impressing continually on something, and you're impressing continually on something, you would imagine that after a while, that form, that impression, would take form. The idea that it doesn't take form, there's, there's, there's impression, 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 and form is always refused. The refusal of form, it, it, for me, I have a sense of violence in that refusal, in that inability to attain form. Something about that, uh, conceptually, intuitively, seems violent to me. And I'm, you know, I, the truth of the matter is I'm never going to go back to this and think about this any deeper than I am at, during this lecture. But something about sort of the really ethereal um, preconditions of violence at a very abstract level, I think I could probably work with Plato. Plato to me is here, right? Because it seems like violence is, I'm trying to make an impression, so you can imagine this is it, and I want to make an impression. I want, after I make that impression, that it's holes, right? So here's the state of affairs. I'm making that impression, and I want, after I make that impression, I want it to hold. If it gives back, then it forces me to, you know, and then you have this infinite violence Stay. You can imagine, like, stay down, change, you know, it, for me, there's something, I might be taking it a little bit too abstract, a little too far, but I, I, my gut tells me that, you know, you can think of, you can root violence, not necessarily even just in terms of rape, physical, interpersonal violence, but violence in its most abstracted sense, violence as such, as reducible to an inability to conform to the externality of some other force. I, it, you would... You know, you would stop being subjugated if you would just do what I want you to do. If you would just assume the form that I want you to assume, but the resilience, if you will. And there might be some, you know, there might be some, in fairness to Plato, and, may, you know, it'd be interesting to see how a contemporary account from Butler might, might sort of respond to this critique. So she, she I didn't even think I was going to get here, but she, she critiques, she criticizes Gray. But the idea is to defend this as a good feminist position, well, you know, there is, there is an externality, uh, it is imposing itself, and the Korah um, doesn't remain fixed in that, it, it, it doesn't assume any impression itself. It doesn't assume any impression, insofar as it is being impressed upon, but it never assumes any impression, I do see a sense in which to defend Aragore you can identify that as, um, as irreverent, like a good feminist irreverence. Like, I'm not going to bow, I will not conform, I will not be impressed upon, I am, you know, I can see that. So I don't want to discredit Irigure in any sense, right? It's, you know, and I don't want to be here, oh, Butler's the greatest thing of all time. I think Butler is very insightful, obviously. I think her articulation is genius. There's no question about that. But there is a sense in which Despite the fact that I'm excluded, despite the fact that I'm not one of sort of the constituent members of materiality, I'm this other thing, I'm this non-material, I'm this non-existence, I, I still have a role in this game that we're playing. Right? I still have function, I still have purpose, I still have meaning. Without me, things aren't transformed, right? There's, there's just materiality, but that materiality needs to be shaped. So you, 
this externality need me, this force, in order to transform your world. Because technically speaking, as, as per Plato, it's not my world, right? It's not the, I'm assuming the position now of the feminine, right? It's not my world, but I'm integral in transforming, in creating the force with which you, the externality, can then shape and transform the world, right? So it's, I think it's a little bit more complicated, right? I think it's profoundly more complicated, and to generalize it is, um, oh, Irigure's position is just so obviously ridiculous, is, would be fallacious. I know Butler's not doing that, but I do want to defend Aragorae's position a bit. Um, I do. So, their participation in her, da da da, I know that she is never, da da da. Okay. Um, so, for example, contemplate the following riddle. A father and his son are in an accident and the father dies instantly. The son is taken to the hospital. The doctor takes one look at him and says, I can't operate on him. He's my son. How is this possible? So father and his son um, are in a horrible car accident, and the father dies instantly. The son is immediately then taken to the hospital, and the doctor looks at the, the son and says, I can't operate on him. I can't operate on him. He's my son. You know, I actually saw this for the first time. I was very young. I was probably about 14-ish, maybe 15, maybe at the most. and. I was watching Cosby Show, and in preparation of this, I tried to find the episode of the Cosby Show where they said this, but I know for a fact I saw this in the Cosby Show. And I remember being so perplexed. I mean, I'm older now, so I'm like, this is the dumbest riddle ever. But I remember being young and like, I, how is that possible? Dad and the son are in a car. The car crashes. Terrible accident. Dad dies. They rush the kid to the hospital. Um, they're going to operate on the kid. He's battered. He's bruised up. Doctor looks at the kid and says, I can't operate on it. On a kid, it's my son. Obviously, it's the mom. The mom's a doctor. <laughs> Obviously. But I remember being young and being like, I have no idea how to solve that riddle. I just, you know, and then I was shamed, as I and all of us should be, by the absurdity of not knowing this. Now, granted, it would be interesting to see if times have changed. Maybe I'll tell this riddle to my kids uh, today and see if they figured it out. They're pretty smart. Um, they're definitely smarter than me than I was at that time. But you get the idea, right? No, it's any other number of possibilities, but it's clearly the case that the doctor is not the mother. Why? Because women aren't the source of knowledge. Women aren't the source of blah, 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 and all the stereotypes and such. All right, so uh, lastly then, the fact that this is even a riddle demonstrates the power of exclusion and the erasure of being. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, um, we only have one section left, and then we finish Butler but we've also finished, I lost uh, my battery, um, like time flies when you're doing this stuff. <laughs> I lost uh, sort of sense of my battery, so I lost uh, a little bit of the last bit that I'm saying, so let me just sort of re-articulate uh, some of the stuff. I, we, we've concluded the discussion um, on Butler in this section, but what I did in section 2.2 was I list some of the problems that Butler were, was having. When I begin the new section, this is the stuff that was lost when the battery uh, tripped out. When I begin the, the, the last section, section 2.3 of this, this, this analysis, not only into just Butler, but also into my lecture series on qualitative methodology, what, I, what I'm going to do is leave this on the board. So I'm going to erase everything else, come present the final section of the lecture series and the final section of Butler, but this is going to be in the background. And then we'll add two... Butler's problems, right? So I'll add da, 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 more points because it's very, very complex, her sort of deconstruction, not deconstruction, but her critique, theoretical um, critique of Plato and Irigaray's position. So I'm going to leave this up and then we'll sort of itemize it. Most of the stuff we should know now well, as I was saying, and I lost this last bit. I would say we probably have about an 80% understanding um, based on my sense of my are the, the effectiveness of my articulation of Butler's otherwise opaque position, I feel hearing myself present this lecture that, no, I've been very clear, the audience should understand. So I feel I'm at about 80% of communicating her idea. What we'll do in the very last section is flesh this out, and by the end of the, the lecture series and the end of the section, you'll have a complete understanding of Butler's um, conceptual critique of Plato, and the importance will be obvious, right? It will be uh, after this, after Butler, for all practical purposes, it will be the onus 
of emerging feminist theorists to to address her role in dismantling the structuralist foundations for feminist theory. And the question will eventually become, was she successful? Did she do a good enough job? What did she overlook? What could she have contributed that she didn't contribute? And this is what we do, right? This is what Gen Xers and Millennials will do, right? I think Millennials are still in school studying. Um, there might be a few who are out with PhDs already. I don't know. They'd be pretty you'd be pretty ahead of the curve, but I think um, millennials are still studying actively, uh, but you can imagine the next five, five, obviously ten years, there's going to be a whole new crop of young academics, and, you know, we're going to be making contributions toward, I, I'm young in terms of, you know, 45-ish and under academics, um, making contributions to, to, to the discipline, right, and feminist theory is hugely important, and I can see it only getting more important and obviously the goal and the role of our social activism in terms of whether you're doing grassroots uh, work or you're giving a lecture series, as simple as this is, a lecture series on <clears throat> feminist interpretations, the ability to see women in a different light, the ability not to sort of objectify as our sort of de facto uh, interpretational, interrelational response with women. And this is within the community of women on women as well, right? It's not just men and women, it's women on women as well. Um, quick side note before I stop this bit and then we go on to the next and final uh, section. I think contemporary 21st century reality TV shifts, arguably. This might be a contentious claim, but I think the objectification is, is heavily woman on woman now, right? It's a lot of sort of the materiality in terms of maybe fashion, the materiality in terms of beauty, the relationship of um, sort of prowess and, and appeal, a lot, a lot of violence, and in terms of, I don't mean physical violence, but as I was saying, this theoretical conception of violence, very, very subtle, um, suggestive violence is, is also being propagated by women on women, not just men on women. So I think we need to, we need to start thinking about these concepts because you better believe that the latency, the latency of these concepts in no sense negates the manifestation of social ill, in no sense negates the manifestation of social conflict. Social conflict is absolutely informed by the latency of these um, concepts and I would say it's even, it's even more dangerous because we don't know that we are actively operationalizing something, right, because it's so latent, it's not obvious. It's our responsibility to make sense of that and I am going to try and give Butler's alternative to this in the very last section. With that, I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell. Have a good day.